This is part six on Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. And I promised last time that we would focus on the question of how do you obey this command right here? Be filled with the Spirit. This is a passive verb, right? In a sense, it doesn't tell you to do anything but to experience something. Something is done to you. You are filled. And yet, it's a command. And so, there must be some steps in our mind, in our heart, in our eyes. What? So, that's what we're focusing on. Therefore, look carefully how you walk. Christians do not coast. They are vigilant to try to live as a certain, in a certain obedience. Not as unwise, but as wise, purchasing the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be wise. And do not get drunk with wine. You lose touch with reality. How could you ever look carefully how you will walk if you're in a drunken stupor out of touch with reality? For that leads to debauchery, a kind of wasted life with excessive sinfulness. That is sinfulness, which of course all is excessive, but this goes beyond ordinary sinning to life-destroying sin. But rather, instead of being influenced in unreality, by alcohol, be influenced in reality by fullness of the Holy Spirit, which now overflows with addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And sometimes people say that actually Paul is telling us how to be filled with the Holy Spirit with these participles, addressing one another, singing, making melody, giving thanks, submitting. Those, those five para, uh, participles do all modify, be filled. But I don't think they modify by telling us the means by which we get filled, but the result of being filled. I don't think it's good advice to say to someone, Submit to other Christians, and then later, wives, submit to your husbands in order that you may be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, there may be a reflex effect of obedience that enables us to experience more of the Holy Spirit, but to tell people to do things apart from the enabling of the Holy Spirit so that they can have the Holy Spirit is bad advice, I think, produces legalists. It's a hopeless way forward. So, what is the answer then to the question, how do you obey this command? I'm going to go back and see two texts that we've seen already and argue that there are several steps that you can actually take, and the first one is prayer. So, here's Paul in Ephesians 1 modeling by his prayer for us how we can pray for each other. And I should say, This command right here, be filled with the Spirit, is addressed not only to every individual Christian, but to the Christians as a group because it tells us to address one another. So one of the effects of being filled is that we address one another. So it's right for me to pray for you, which I do right now. I'm praying, oh God, grant that those who are watching this would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I hope you pray that for me. So Paul is modeling here in chapter one how to do that. I pray that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you a spirit of wisdom. Give you Christians a spirit of wisdom. Now, we already have the spirit, so I take him to mean more and more of the spirit experienced through wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God with the eyes of our hearts enlightened because of this spirit filling us with greater influence to know him and to be enlightened. So, this is prayer. That's step number one, and it comes right out of Paul's own 
pursuit of the fullness of the Spirit in the lives of the Ephesians. Here's uh, the most beautiful prayer in Paul, I think, in chapter 3, 14 following. For this reason I bow my knees. So he's praying for the Ephesians before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you, this is his prayer, grant you Christians to be strengthened, how? With power through his Spirit. So he's praying that the Holy Spirit would be experienced with power in our inner being with this effect, right? And then this effect, and then this effect. <laughs> it goes on and on. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Christ is already in the hearts of believers. And so this dwelling here is uh, manifestly, experientially, we know him as his dwelling and he exerts himself by the Spirit that you may be being rooted and grounded in love. You may have strength. This strength in here now is expressed in what? To comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. So there it is. We know the love of Christ by the prayer of Paul for the Spirit to strengthen us to see his love. And the effect is that love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that, another, that, you may be filled with all the fullness of God, which is really the same, is it not, of uh, chapter 5, verse 18, 19. Be full of the Holy Spirit. So the way forward, the least we can say so far, is prayer, prayer, prayer. Ask God, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Now let's not miss this. It comes, he says, grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Christ exerts himself, strengthens us to know him through faith. So let me draw that out. So this is step two. We cry out to God in prayer that he would fill us. And then here's several passages that connect the spirit and faith. This is Acts 6. The deacons are being chosen. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So there they are, side by side, faith and the Holy Spirit, hand in hand, filling Stephen. Here's Barnabas, another example, chapter 11. When Barnabas came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, came to Antioch. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. So there it is again, the Holy Spirit filling and faith filling. So faith goes hand in hand. Now here, two more on this. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's how it happens. That's how this, this joy, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, peace, fruit of the Holy Spirit, it comes through believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, which you have through believing, seems to be implied, doesn't it? Isn't it? May the, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, which you have in believing, you may abound in hope. Here's the most explicit and the most important passage on the relationship between faith and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you unto fullness, right? You want to be full, you need a big supply. Supplies the Spirit to you 
and works miracles among you, does he do so by works of the law? No. Or does he do it by hearing with faith? Yes. So we hear the gospel, we hear the word of God, we hear the promises, and we believe them, and in believing them, the Spirit is supplied unto fullness. Oh, sweet. This is what we can do, which implies then a sequence of events or processes or habits that I'll just describe to you now as we as we close. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You see the connection here? Does the supply of the Spirit come to you with works of the law? Do you work your way into fullness? No. You hear and believe your way into fullness. You listen and you believe. And this is in Romans 10, what we believe. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word. Oh, there's, this is why we... This is why we read our Bibles every morning, because we want to be full of the Holy Spirit, right? That's why you read your Bible, isn't it? To be filled with the Holy Spirit, because when we look at the Word, we see Christ, and when we see Christ, faith is awakened, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. So when we see or hear or read the Word, we see Christ and faith is awakened, and through that faith flows the Spirit. So here, here's my pattern. I'm sure not perfect in this, but oh, how I long for it. Psalm 119, I pray, incline my heart to your testimonies. In other words, you get up in the morning, and you don't always want to read your Bible, right? So what do you do? You say, well, I'd be a hypocrite if I read my Bible today, so I don't want to just do something out of duty. No, that's not what you do. You don't cave in like that. That's not what soldiers do. Spiritual soldiers cry out, incline, incline, incline. Knock me over, God, with your testimonies. Make me want your testimonies. Make me want your testimonies. And then you pray, open my eyes. So you start reading, you don't see anything. What do you do? Give up? Well, I'm not going to see anything today. No. It's too valuable. It's too precious. It's gold. It's honey. You cry out, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your instruction. And then finally you pray, God, would you now? that I have been inclined to your word, and I am seeing things in your word, would you satisfy me? And that is the Old Testament way of saying, fill me, fill me, fill us. <laughs> so I am praying for you. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad in you all our days. And what's the effect of that? Sing, 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 sing to the Lord and to one another from your heart. God, do it.